Okay. Uh, so this is our second week from last, from the last. And last week I was talking about range and endurance. And actually we finished that topic, but let me just make a quick review of range and endurance today. And then I will continue with the turning flight, which is the last topic of uh, the course. Um, so last week we covered range and endurance, and here's, here are the definitions of range and endurance. By basically, range is the, the total distance you can travel with a full tank of fuel, and endurance is the total time you can stay in the air with a full tank of fuel. Uh, to calculate range and endurance for aircraft, uh, there's just one equation we use, and that equation is uh, shows how much fuel is consumed by the engine, right? So that's the, the, the main equation used for range and induced calculations. Uh, so let me so let me remind you uh, how we drive the equations. Um, well, first we said that the, the weight of the aircraft, the full weight of the aircraft is composed of the empty weight um, amount of fuel. So this is the part that changes, the amount of fuel changes during the flight. And uh, to uh, calculate range and endurance, we, uh, I said we use one equation, and that equation is the following. That equation shows how much uh, the amount of fuel burned changes. And we said that we assume that this is proportional with the uh, engine performance. So if we are talking about a propeller engine, then um, the engine produces power, and depending on the amount of power, the fuel burn rate is proportional to that, right? So we take power and multiply it with a constant number, and this is the equation after or behind uh, the range of energy calculations for propeller uh, aircraft. Uh, so in this equation, Uh, this C is the specific fuel consumption assumed to be constant and this P term is the, the power produced by the engine In other words, this is the available power, PA, and not the required power, right? Um, so this is for propeller. And if you're talking about a jet aircraft, then in that case, this WFP dot is uh, defined as uh, to be proportional with engine thrust. So you put T here and you multiply it again with a constant number and we call this thrust specific fuel consumption. Um, and similarly this T is the available thrust. So this T is engine thrust. Okay? Um, so by integrating this equation you can calculate range and endurance and the derivations are in last week's lecture notes. Um, so obviously uh, you can go further so this is the most general equation we start from there and we say that if you are doing a steady level flight then these will be equal right these are equal for steady level flight and using that equality you can insert instead of power available power required and power required uh, we have equations for power required by using them uh, you can uh, obtain specific equations for that uh, flight type and the simplified equations obtained that way are called Bregge equations for uh, steady level flight so if you look at last Friday's lecture notes then you will see summary table that uh, puts all the equations together for the state level flight condition. 
Um, okay, so these are the simplified equations for range, and the endurance equations are given here. And Uh, and as I said, you are responsible uh, to know where the equations, where these equations come from, or you should be able to get them from the basic equation. Okay? Uh, so you don't need to know this equation by heart. But uh, when I ask you a question about this, I will expect you to drive it first. So in other words, if you just take this equation and use it to answer a question, then you will lose points for that. Because I expect you to uh, drive that equation. And I will specifically say so in the question. Uh, so, I strongly suggest you to take a look at previous year's questions because I, I don't really have time to solve example problems in class, but you have sufficient number of uh, questions from previous years, so you should definitely look at those uh, equations. Uh, so, this was a data or for a real A cup, and so you get an idea of the ratio of these numbers. For example, for this aircraft, uh, the, the maximum takeoff weight with a full tank of fuel is this much in terms of kilograms. And if you uh, look at the, uh, the zero fuel weight, so the, these are the W0 and W1 numbers. And the difference between the two is the amount of fuel. Um, okay, so by looking at these equations, you can sense what is important in terms of range and endurance. And um, so the, 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 again, if you go back to last week's lecture notes, you will find notes regarding that. Let's see. So by just looking at this equation, you can save these things. So if you want to maximize range, these are the things you need to do. And uh, the most effective one out of all of these is the last one because it's very difficult to obtain big improvements by working on these three I items, right? Uh, so the amount of fuel is the most significant thing that determines range and endurance. Uh, okay, so uh, as I said last week, you, you need to think about these equations. Uh, uh, for example, while driving these equations, we assumed that these ratios were constant, and that's why we took them out of the integral. And you need to think about what that really means. Uh, you know, aerodynamic coefficients depend on the angle of attack, right? So if, you <coughs> if your aircraft flies at a certain angle, then that angle determines the lift coefficient, and the drag coefficient is determined as a function of that. Um, so maybe I should repeat that part. So you have the lift coefficient depending on angle of attack. This is CL. Uh, so if you're flying at a certain angle, this is your flight angle of attack. That means this is your lift coefficient. And the drag coefficient corresponding to that comes from the drag polar. This is CL versus CD. And for the same CL value, you have a certain CD. For example, this angle is your CL. Uh, the tangent of the angle gives you the lift to drag ratio, right? So this is theta. Okay, so for a steady level flight, you need to have this equation, which should be equal to lift, which is um, so if you choose CL for chosen for maximum range or endurance, let's say. And this dictates the flight speed, right? So if you want to uh, reach your maximum range, then that means you have to fly at a certain CL value, and that certain CL value
Uh, so uh, you need to fly at a specific ratio. For example, if you are if you are flying a propeller aircraft and if you are concerned about the range, this is the ratio you need to maximize. Uh, for jet aircraft, this is the ratio. Again, there are four different ratios here. Those are the ratios you need to uh, maximize. And each one of these ratios means that you have to fix your angle of attack. And if your angle of attack is fixed, then um, your flight speed is determined out of this equation. So your flight speed should be equal to but since the weight changes during flight and this means that the speed of the aircraft should change as well, should change if you want to maximize uh, either range or endurance. Um, but if you are, uh, if you want to keep speed the same, speed constant, if you want to keep V constant, then CL should change during flight as W changes So as you uh, consume fuel, the W will be getting smaller, that means CL will be getting smaller as well. CL will be getting smaller as W gets smaller. That means all of these ratios will be changing as well. Okay, so these are um, uh, the critical things about this uh, state level flight condition. So you need to take all this into account. And if you look at uh, previous year's exam questions, you will see that I ask questions related to these. Or you can choose to change the altitude, for example. You may say that I want to keep uh, maximize range, so I want to keep this at the maximum possible value. And I want to change the speed of the flight constant as well. So you may uh, bring that as a requirement. And in that case, you need to change something else, and that something can very well be the air density, for example. So you keep uh, this ratio at the maximum. You keep speed constant as well and you can change the altitude of the flight so that's also a possibility so for example if you are so if you want to maximize this for example the endurance of a jet aircraft or the range of a propeller aircraft this one you know they both require this ratio to be maximum and you start flying uh, with that condition so you start flying at this point where the, the ratio is maximum but if you um, want to keep the speed of flight constant then CL will be getting smaller as I said here so that means you will be sliding down on this uh, drag polar curve right so you see your flight will not be optimized for range anymore. Okay, so, so these are the important things about the simplified range and endurance equations. And um, 
Uh, I'm sure that once you look at the uh, sample questions regarding these topics, you will have some questions and we will have a chance to go over those uh, questions last, uh, next week, which is the last week of the semester. Okay, so do you have any questions? Okay, then let me move on to the last topic, which is in fact a very important topic. And this is very important in aircraft design, as I will try to explain. Um, so we'll be turn, talking about the turning flight. And we will start with uh, a level turn maneuver, a, a sustained level turn maneuver. And then we will continue pull up and pull down maneuvers. They are uh, very similar. Uh, so I will spend most of the time on the level turn maneuver and when you understand that you can use that information to explain pull up and pull down maneuvers very easily. Okay, so this is what I mean by a level turn maneuver. So if you look at the top view of an aircraft, so this is how the maneuver looks like. So for example, if you are flying in to one direction and if you want to change the direction of the flight, so this is the type of maneuver you need to do, right? For example, if you are, let's say, flying towards north, so let's say this is north, this is west and east, and if your aircraft is flying that way and you want to go to west, for example, you need to change the, uh, the direction of the aircraft through a turn maneuver like that, right? So this is the type of maneuver we are talking about. Um, so we will study a sustained turn maneuver. That means the maneuver, the aircraft turns in a steady manner. Okay, so it turns with a constant angular speed, for example, and uh, at a constant radius. It will be uh, turning through a perfectly circular path. So this is the type of maneuver we will be studying. Uh, sustained means that aircraft turns in a steady manner, and speed and altitude of the aircraft do not change during the turn. And uh, so from here, we can immediately say that the engine thrust should be equal to the aerodynamic drag force. If you don't want the speed to change, then you need to have such a force balance equation in the horizontal plane. Uh, now, let me talk about how an aircraft turns. So this is different than how a car turns, for example. So, and, uh, okay, so if you consider a car making a turning maneuver like that, um, so let me clean this diagram first and then okay so suppose that you're driving a car and you want to make a turn right let's, let's say you want to make a right turn uh, so your aim is to go in this direction and let's consider the accelerations on our uh, aircraft during that maneuver. Uh, so we already have the weight due to gravitational acceleration. So this is uh, the acceleration the car experiences uh, at all times. And when making a turn maneuver, uh, the, um, the aircraft needs to have a horizontal acceleration in that direction, right? So this is uh, back view or rear view. And if you want to look at the top view, so if this is your aircraft and this is where you're going, this is the speed vector, and if you are making a turn like this, uh, your car needs to have a horizontal acceleration, right, to make uh, the direction of your the velocity vector uh, rotate, you need to have such an acceleration, and this acceleration depends on the speed and the radius, right? You know this from your physics courses. So if this is the, ra the radius of turn, R, um, the acceleration in the horizontal direction will be equal to W uh, B squared divided by R, right? Um, okay, so if during this maneuver, the people inside the car will feel 
a centrifugal acceleration due to that rotation, right? And that will be in the opposite direction. So let me... So if you are a passenger in the car or if you are driving the car, then during that maneuver you will be feeling that uh, centrifugal acceleration. And during the turning you will uh, feel this side force, right? Um, uh, so if you especially take a very steep turn, then if you are turning very fast, then this force will be really significant and uh, you will be moving towards the, uh, the outer direction. Or if you have something like hanging on the mirror, then that object will be reflecting that acceleration. I don't know if you paid attention to that before, but if you are turning in a car and if there is something hanging from the mirror, then that something will be uh, moving uh, outwards due to this uh, rotational acceleration. Um, so this is how you turn a car. Um, so if you want to do the same kind of thing in an airplane, then uh, the same thing will be happening there as well. So suppose that you are flying an aircraft, and if you are turning the aircraft just like a car, that means the wings are always parallel to uh, the ground, then you will feel such, uh, there will be such a force, centrifugal force on the, um, the people within the aircraft will experience. Uh, so if you are driving a car, this is your only option, right? Because the wheels always have to be parallel to the, uh, or the, the body of the car will always have to be parallel to the ground. You cannot change uh, the orientation of the car with respect to the road surface. So this type of turning is called skid to turn in aircraft. Okay, the, the, it's turn like, like a car. That means the wings of the aircraft stay parallel to the ground and the aircraft turns with pure yaw wing with roll angle equal to zero. This turn maneuver is called skid to turn. And um, so let's not worry about this missile reference here. But if you are flying in three-dimensional space and you have all six degrees of freedom, then you can do a, a better turning maneuver. And that better turning maneuver is to change the roll angle of your airplane while turning. Um, For example, um, so these are the forces, or you can just cancel M terms and talk about accelerations directly. So these are the accelerations, and during a turn maneuver, you, in addition to the gravitational acceleration, there is such a centrifugal acceleration, and during that maneuver, if you change the roll orientation of the airplane, so again, we're looking at the a rear view, and if you give the airplane a roll angle, and let me show that angle here. So this is the angle I'm talking about. Let me call that P. Uh, and if you uh, adjust that angle such that the resultant acceleration vector becomes perpendicular to the wings, um, as shown in, in this diagram here, uh, this is the gravitational acceleration, centrifugal acceleration. Their vector sum is this vector here. If you change the roll angle such that the net, the total acceleration vector becomes perpendicular to the wings of the airplane, then uh, the people within the airplane will not feel an electrical acceleration anymore. Right? Does it make sense? Uh, so normally, let's go back to the car example. You are sitting in this car here. So suppose that this is you, and during the rotation you will feel such a force. Um, that's because you have a lateral acceleration uh, you're experiencing in addition to the gravitational acceleration. But in the case of an airplane, 
during again a level term maneuver if you can change if you do change the bank angle or the roll angle of your airplane such that the total acceleration becomes perpendicular to the wings of the airplane then the only acceleration you'll be feeling will be uh, you'll be feeling the total acceleration and that total acceleration will be uh, so let me draw a a person here, suppose that there's a person here. So anyway, this person will be feeling an acceleration in this direction. In other words, it will be in the same direction as uh, you normally feel the gravitational acceleration, right? So there will be no additional sideways acceleration uh, during this type of turning maneuver. Is this uh, clear? So this is a very nice thing about this turn maneuver, and that type of maneuver is called a bank to turn, and that must be explained somewhere here. Okay, so in fact I have a similar diagram here. So this is the bank angle, and if you are making a very fast turn, then this, there will be a huge centrifugal acceleration, and even in that case, you can if you can adjust the roll angle carefully such that the total acceleration vector becomes perpendicular to the uh, the horizontal axis of the airplane, um, then people sitting in the aircraft will feel no lateral acceleration. They will feel increased uh, vertical acceleration though, right? Normally, you just feel this acceleration, but during such a turn maneuver, you will feel this acceleration, which is obviously a bigger acceleration than just this one. Um, okay, so this type of turn maneuver where the bank angle is set perfectly to ensure no lateral acceleration occurs is called a coordinated turn. Um, and changing the bank angle of an aircraft during turning maneuver is called bank to turn maneuver. Okay, so we will be talking about this type of turning maneuver. So it is very difficult to perform that maneuver, by the way, compared to this one. So if you just try to turn with pure yawing, then the only thing you need to control is the rudder. By changing the rudder, you can make a pure yawing maneuver, and there's just one thing to control. But if you want to change, if you want to perform a bank turn maneuver like this, <coughs> then you need to control all the aircraft controls simultaneously. So you need to control the ailerons because you need a bank angle. You use ailerons for that. And you, you still need to control the rudder because the, the side slope angle needs to be regulated during this maneuver. You need to control the elevator because you need, uh, as I will explain next, uh, you need to control the lift vectors. And Last, the engine thrust needs to be controlled as well because during that maneuver the drag force will be changing and uh, however the drag force changes you need to match it with the engine thrust. So you need to control all four controls simultaneously to perform such a maneuver. Okay, so this is the type of maneuver we'll be talking about, and as you will see later today, uh, this maneuver is very important and in, it dictates pretty much the entire design of the aircraft. So depending on how much or how much turning performance you want your aircraft to have, uh, you need to design the wings accordingly because the wing design will become very important, aerodynamic design. You need to choose your engine accordingly because even the engine is, becomes very important. So just for the turning performance, you're, you need to pick a different engine if you want a very high performance aircraft. Or if you want, you, the structural design will have to be made accordingly. Uh, and everything is, every aspect of aircraft design becomes important in such a bank turn maneuver. Okay, so let's continue with these equations. Um, so as I said, uh, we will be studying sustained level turn maneuver. 
So the important thing is the speed of the aircraft shouldn't change during the maneuver and the altitude shouldn't change as well. Okay, so that means you need to satisfy two force equations. So I already just showed you the first force equation. The first one is just this one. The thrust should be equal to the drag force. And the second force equation should be in the vertical direction. And that force uh, equality you can see in this diagram. So this time we're looking at the front view. Um, so this time this is the, the radius of turn. And the bank angle of the aircraft is shown here. The weight of the aircraft is always towards the center of the earth. And during such a bank banking maneuver, the lift vector should be in that direction, right? Because the lift vector will, is always perpendicular to the wings of the aircraft. So the wings are here. So I think this figure is not very correct. But let's say that this red arrow should be perpendicular to the wings of the aircraft. And if you write the, the vertical force equation, you will see that the weight should be equal to the vertical component of this vector, right? And the vertical component of that vector is given by this relation, the lift times cosine of the bank angle. So this needs to be satisfied. And uh, there's a third equation involved. This, the first one is the thrust is equal to drag equation. The second equation is this one. And the third equation is <coughs> related to turning. So the lift, since you have tilted the lift vector as such, uh, the, ver the vertical component should be equal to the weight. And there's obviously be going to be a horizontal component. And this horizontal component uh, is the component that, is, that creates the turning, right? Uh, so you are turning in uh, that direction. So there should be an acceleration in this direction. And that acceleration is created by the horizontal component of the lift vector. <coughs> and the equ equation for that is uh, shown here. The horizontal component of the lift vector is the lift force times the sine of the bank angle. And this should be equal to mass times acceleration. And the acceleration is the turning acceleration, the centrifugal acceleration. Okay? So we have these three equations involved in a sustained level turn equation, sustained level turn maneuver. Okay, do you have any questions? Uh, so then let me proceed with how we use these equations. Uh, okay, so. Um, so we take these two equations, this one and this other one, and we do the following. We take the squares of both of these equations and add them together to get rid of these uh, trigonometric terms. So the square of the first equation is here. The square of the second equation is this equation. And instead of mass, I just wrote weight divided by gravity. And if you add them together, you all know that this will be equal to 1. And from there you get this relation, right? L squared divided by W squared is equal to 1 plus A squared by G squared. So this is just simple uh, algebra here. And <coughs> so at this point we define a very important parameter and we call that the load factor. So we take the ratio lift to weight and uh, define it as load factor. So we call this L over W ratio N and it's denoted by small case letter N. Uh, so it's a non-dimensional parameter because lift is a force. Weight of the aircraft is again a force. You are dividing two force terms and you, what you get is a non-dimensional number. But as you will uh, understand why in a few minutes, uh, this is usually quoted in terms of G's. Okay? So if you use this definition, then you can write L squared divided by W squared simply as N squared. So you have this relation for a sustained level turn maneuver. So G is the, the gravitational acceleration. N is the load factor 
of the maneuver. And A is the, the lateral acceleration of the aircraft during that maneuver, which is equal to this. So this is equal to A. Okay, uh, so the, uh, let's take a look at these uh, accelerations again. So let me just get rid of these mass terms and just talk about accelerations only. Uh, so during a sustained level term maneuver, um, the, the vertical acceleration is the gravitational acceleration G, and you have a lateral acceleration that is equal to A, and the total acceleration experienced by the people inside the airplane is the vector sum of these two, which is given by this expression, g squared plus a squared. Okay? And instead of a squared, if you use this equation we just obtained, if you write this uh, into a squared here, and this is what you get, g squared plus n squared minus 1 times g squared. Uh, so these... Uh, <coughs> Uh, g squared here will be cancelled by the minus 1 within the parentheses, and in the end you get n times g. And that means during a sustained level term maneuver <coughs> with a load factor of n, people on board the aircraft experience a net acceleration that is n times the gravitational acceleration g. And that's why uh, the n is uh, quoted in terms of g's. So if you are making a turn such that the total acceleration becomes 2 times g, then you will experience a 2G force. Okay. <clears throat> so, in fact, I have a bunch of nice videos I would like to show related to this. And before the break, let me show you one of them at least, and then. We can take a break. Um, Uh, so you, here you see an F-15 aircraft performing a level turn maneuver, and in fact it's doing a very steep turn maneuver, uh, as you can see. So it's difficult to see exactly, but you can see that the altitude is more or less constant during the maneuver. So it makes a complete circle, a 360 degree turn, and then continues. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, the banking is, is quite high, as you can see here, right? It's almost a 90 degrees bank angle during this maneuver. Uh, so that's a very, very difficult maneuver to perform, by the way. And let me explain why. Uh, if you have such a steep bank angle, then the aircraft needs to have a very, very large lift force to keep the altitude constant, right? And you can easily see that if you look at this diagram. Well, you can look at this diagram as well. Uh, so, the, in the vertical direction, <coughs> the lift force should be able to balance the weight of the aircraft, right? So, this should be satisfied. Uh, but if you have a very large bank angle, as you see in that video, and in that case, your lift vector will be like this. It will be almost horizontal. And to be able to balance the weight then it needs to be very large, right? The lift force should be a very, very large force. Uh, and that just comes from this relation here. So that the lift force should be equal to uh, the weight divided by the cosine of bank angle. 
And in fact, the bank angle can never be perfectly 90 degrees because of this relation. Because that means the lift should go to infinity if you want to perform a, a 90 degree bank uh, maneuver. So that's really impossible uh, for a sustained maneuver. But if you want to perform a sustained maneuver with a very large bank angle, then uh, the, uh, the lift vector should be very, very large. And how much the, the lift force should be depends on the load factor, right? And the load factor depends on the, uh, the bank angle. Um, so the, the, there's, I will talk about this video, but I can use this one as well. So this image is taken from uh, that video. So it's very hard to see here, but if you look at, if you try to get some data out of this video. So this is the, the bank angle and the load factor is going to be equal to 1 over cosine that angle. So for example, if the bank angle is 80 degrees, then the load factor turns out to be 5.75. That means during that maneuver, uh, the lift force should be n times w. So it's going, <coughs> it's, uh, it needs to be about 6 times the weight of the airplane. So you need to have a very huge lift force during that maneuver. And that's not the only thing. And the, the person within the aircraft will need to uh, sustain an acceleration that is that much greater than the, uh, the gravitational acceleration. Okay? So let's just give a break and I will keep talking about this after the break. <coughs>